Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're continuing our exploration of Sufism, uh, the Islamic form of mysticism, in the context of our uh, exploration of the history of ideas about well-being. Uh, and um, we began by talking about the rootedness of the Sufi tradition uh, in the Muslim scripture, the Quran. Uh, today, we'll turn, and again, depending heavily on uh, the work of uh, Professor Carl Ernst, uh, who, whose text we're reading, uh, we'll turn uh, to the issue of Sufi practice. Uh, Sufism was very much a tradition centered on uh, exemplars, on great spiritual uh, individuals who gained a reputation for piety uh, that often survived their own lifetimes and sometimes even uh, lasted well into our own day. Uh, these are holy personages. Typically, uh, the word in Arabic, wali, that the Sufis used for this uh, individual is translated in English as saint. Uh, there have been specialists who've complained about this choice of words, but uh, I think it conveys well enough uh, to a uh, Western audience uh, what, what is meant. Um, uh, saints were people to whom one could turn, uh, being most of us on a much lower rang of uh, spiritual development and achievement, saints were ones that the Sufis believed one could turn to uh, for intercession with, uh, with the Prophet Muhammad or with God. Uh, there are strains of Islam, uh, such as the uh, Wahhabi uh, religion that predominates in Saudi Arabia, that typically completely reject uh, the idea of intercession. Um, but historically speaking, intercession, the idea of intercession with God is a very old one, and we find first century or second century uh, Muslim uh, rock inscriptions in Western Arabia uh, speaking of, uh, of the Prophet as an intercessor with God, and that was obviously a very important idea in uh, the era of late antiquity in which Islam uh, developed. So uh, Abdul Karim uh, Kusheri, who is one of the great Sufi writers uh, who died in the 11th century, uh, said that the saint is one of the pious for whom God takes responsibility. The saint is one who takes responsibility for piety and continual devotion. So the saint takes responsibility for uh, his or her own uh, devotion, uh, but achieves such an exalted spiritual status because of God's favor. Uh, Kusheri, like many medieval Muslim thinkers, attributed uh, to the Prophet Muhammad a state of sinlessness, and one that uh, he extended to uh, the, the Sufi saints. Again, to the ears of some Muslim modernists or uh, those of a Wahhabi or Salafi persuasion, uh, this idea of, of, the, of the saints sharing in the prophet's sinlessness uh, sounds perhaps blasphemous today, but it's been a widespread belief among Sufis through history. Uh, the ecstatic Sufi thinker Bayezid Bistami of the ninth century uh, depicted saints as brides of God. And that language of union with God, of God as the beloved, uh, is very central to the Sufi tradition. Uh, and it is held uh, by Sufis that saints often may not know uh, that they are saints. They're spiritual and humble people, after all. And moreover, it's not often possible to recognize uh, the, the saint in one's own environment. Uh, and so a great deal of humility is called for in approaching this subject. Uh, Sufis 
imagined a spiritual hierarchy that, to some extent, mirrored uh, the monarchical and feudal societies in which they functioned. So uh, just as there's a king uh, and then below the king, aristocrats or notables uh, and, uh, and so forth. So in the Sufi realm, uh, there is a, a, a supreme spiritual uh, leader, a, a Rauf or Put, uh, they're called in, in, in Arabic. Uh, and, um, and below uh, that person would be hundreds of members of the spiritual elite uh, who often led Sufi lodges or centers. Uh, and uh, the tradition says then uh, 12,000 lesser saints uh, populated the, the next rang down. Uh, next rung down. So um, uh, th this is a, a spiritual hierarchy uh, mirroring the world of, of kings and, uh, and, and barons and, uh, and, and lesser notability. But in the Sufi imagination, uh, this hierarchy is not about worldly power in any way. Uh, and uh, I've given you a, a picture here of the Mughal Indian ruler uh, of the 17th century, Jahangir, uh, consulting uh, with great uh, Sufi leaders uh, at his court, uh, and uh, that was that was a typical uh, scene uh, at the Mughal court and many other Muslim courts of the, of the king uh, taking counsel uh, from the saints. Um, and of course, above the realm of the saints is that of the prophets. Uh, so Abu Abdurrahman uh, Sulami uh, of the 11th century said, the end of the saints is the beginning of the prophets. Uh, prophets have a whole separate terminology. And in the Muslim tradition, prophets include uh, the patriarchs of the uh, Hebrew Bible, Abraham and uh, uh, and uh, and Jacob and so forth, as well as uh, what what are thought of in the uh, Jewish and tr Christian traditions as prophets, Moses and uh, uh, and so forth, uh, Ezekiel. And, uh, but but then also in Islam, John the Baptist is, is accepted as a prophet. Jesus is seen as a prophet, and the prophet Muhammad himself is part of this. Uh, concatenation of uh, prophetic messengers that God has sent uh, through uh, through history. So uh, the, the Sufis talked about the prophets in different terms <clears throat> than they did about the saints, and they used different terminology. So a prophet might perform a miracle, rajaza, uh, but saints uh, couldn't. Uh, they being lesser beings uh, than a prophet, they could only perform marvels, uh, karamat. Uh, and, and that ability to perform the marvels uh, derived from the blessings or baraka that they had built up uh, by virtue of their pious practice. Um, it was alleged by the Sufi thinkers that the saint's selfish ego is gone. And uh, while Sufism and Buddhism are extremely different uh, traditions and uh, the philosophies of the two, uh, on the whole, are not terribly comparable. This idea of um, of eliminating the selfish ego uh, is perhaps analogous uh, to the Buddhist idea of the no self. Um, if if the selfish ego is gone, then what kind of personality would a saint have? How would you recognize one? And the, the answer uh, that, that some gave was that only God really recognized the saints. So they're not known by mortals. Uh, and people often don't know that themselves that they're saints. Uh, others would say, well, you can tell a saint by the kind of life and the kind of reputation that they gained. Uh, and there are, uh, we're reading uh, Atar's Memorials of the Faithful, which uh, is uh, a, a set of anecdotes and biographies of, uh, of the great Sufi uh, saints that lived before Attar's time. 
these biographies are <clears throat> being told, however, not for the purpose of simply writing a biography. Uh, they are being told, uh, setting forth the saints as exemplars, as people that should be imitated. Uh, and so the stories are typically about avoiding greed, uh, doing good for others uh, for no reward, uh, stories of giving up ambitions to become enormously wealthy, um, and, and some of the saints even uh, like uh, St. Francis of Assisi in the, in the Catholic tradition, uh, more or less took vows of poverty and, and gave up on making a living and turned to begging instead. And I'm showing you here a, uh, a Kashkul uh, from 19th century Iran. It's, it's something that a, a wandering Sufi or dervish uh, would have uh, used in, 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 uh, when they went in the streets begging. Uh, and people would give them money uh, on the premise that uh, the Sufis, uh, in exploring uh, their spirituality and having the time away from earning a, 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 an ordinary living, uh, would uh, develop virtues that would be uh, good for society, and even ultimately maybe would be able to intercede with God for the welfare of the donors. Uh, so. Um, uh, we have seen some of these virtues that are mentioned in the Sufi works uh, are also uh, virtues or practices that have been found in the, uh, the new discipline of positive psychology to be highly correlated with well-being. Uh, certainly um, uh, doing good for others without expectation of reward, uh, acts of uh, altruism, uh, have been shown to be uh, uh, to, to produce well-being, uh, and um, we've also seen that uh, uh, that probably the happiest people are, are not uh, the, the the wealthiest or the ones most driven uh, to succeed. Uh, although the Sufi uh, and, and not all Sufis to vows of po poverty or necessarily lived poverty-stricken lives. In fact, the vast majority of Sufis had more ordinary occupations, and some were quite wealthy. In fact, uh, some rulers, the Ottoman sultans uh, of the uh, early modern period, typically belonged to a Sufi order, and some of them cultivated Sufi practices. So uh, uh, it was not a requirement uh, that one be poor, uh, but some some did take vows of poverty. That, I don't think that... Uh, Deliberately keeping yourself poor is probably uh, associated with uh, with well-being, uh, but but not investing all of your all of one's uh, energies and thought and uh, in, into mere wealth accumulation. Uh, uh, probably the Sufis are right that that's not a good that, that, that those things are not good for a person. Um, Sufism uh, was not a solely male preoccupation. Uh, there are many great uh, women saints, and uh, some uh, uh, have had their biographies and words and poetry preserved. Um, I, uh, I think more would have been preserved had they been institutionalized, and, and this is one difference between the genders in the sense that I think uh, male uh, saints and, uh, and poets uh, often uh, had followers in the next generations who uh, institutionalized uh, the memory of the saint and would copy out their manuscripts, their poetry, memorize them, pass them on to the next generation in a systematic sort of way. And uh, the, the women uh, are not as well represented in history because I think there weren't uh, analogous uh, institutions on, on the female side. Often these would not have been allowed in any case. Um, and uh, women were, in medieval society, somewhat less likely to be uh, literate uh, than, than males, uh, although there were uh, literate Muslim women. And Muslim women in the medieval period were among, I think, probably the wealthiest and most high-status women in the world. 
uh, because Islamic law recognized their right to their own property uh, apart from their husband, whereas in, uh, in Western Europe there was a principle uh, of ouverture uh, in which uh, once a woman married, her property was owned and controlled by her husband. This was not true in Muslim societies, and so uh, many Muslim uh, women merchants and uh, uh, aristocrats uh, grew extremely wealthy and powerful. Uh, so uh, women are well represented in the ranks of the Sufis, and one of the famous ones was uh, Rabi al Adawiya of Basra, uh, who died uh, in, 18, in, in 801. Um, it is said that a famine came to Basra. Uh, and uh, that she abandoned her family for the solitary life of praying in the desert. And uh, one of the sayings attributed to her is, a prayer, O Lord, if I worship you because of fear of hell, then burn me in hell. If I worship you because I desire paradise, then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for yourself alone, uh, then deny me not your eternal beauty. Uh, so, uh, this um, uh, this verse again, uh, conventional uh, religious people may object to it because, after all, the scriptures do uh, promise the virtuous heaven and uh, threaten uh, the uh, the miscreants with hell. Uh, but Rabia is saying she doesn't care about those things. That's not why she uh, is devoting herself uh, to the divine. Uh, it's not because of, of uh, promise of reward or fear of punishment. It's because uh, God is worthy of, as an object of devotion in himself. Uh, in in uh, Mughal India in the early modern period, again, there were many women Sufi saints. Uh, some are mentioned uh, in the biographical dictionaries of that era. Uh, and uh, Professor Ernst tells us about Bibi Jamal Khatun, uh, uh, who died in uh, 1647. Uh, she was the sister of a great uh, male Sufi leader, uh, Mel Jeev, uh, who uh, was at the Mughal court and taught uh, one of the Mughal princes. Uh, but um, uh, And she was married, but she, after 10 years, withdrew into seclusion uh, and uh, began experimenting with seeking alternative states of consciousness. People in India believed that she could perform miracles, uh, could, could give a barren woman a child, and so forth. Uh, but she attained a great reputation in her own right. Um, sometimes Sufis got into trouble with the law. Uh, again, there were all kinds of Sufis, and at some points in Muslim history, most people were, were Sufis, and so it's hard to make meaningful distinctions. But there is a strand of Sufism uh, associated with uh, extravagant and ecstatic uh, utterances, uh, which offended uh, uh, the Orthodox. And so uh, one of those Sufis who got into trouble was Hussein ibn Mansur al-Halaj, about whom a great deal has been written um, even in America, plays have been written and produced about him. Um, and he was actually probably executed by the Abbasid Empire uh, over a ritual matter uh, where he was he had a, a heterodox uh, or uh, unapproved uh, uh, ritual practice. But later, Sufis developed all kinds of stories about Al-Halaj and uh, uh, believed that he had been killed for ecstatic utterances during a trance, uh, that he said things like, I am the eternal truth, I am al-Haq. Uh, and um, this is, of course, very blasphemous in Islamic terms because al-Haq, uh, the, the, the eternal truth, is one of the names of God. Uh, of course, Sufis would maintain that he wasn't being blasphemous and he wasn't saying he was God. Uh, he was saying that he he had put aside his own ego, and so nothing shone from his being but the light of God. 
Um, traditional Sufism is very much about attendance at Sufi tombs. Uh, Sufi saints are not worshipped, and some anthropologists and historians have used that kind of term for their practice. It's incorrect. Uh, they are um, they engage in uh, in reverence towards the Sufi saint. Uh, they attended his shrine, and they have a technical set of terms for all this. Um, visitors do ask the inhabitant of the of the shrine. Uh, for uh, intercession with God or for favors. Um, and shrines typically grew up at the tombs of uh, saintly individuals who passed on. So there's a famous uh, such shrine at Ajmer in northern India uh, for this great Sufi saint, uh, Nuruddin Chishti. Uh, and uh, it's famous in India that both Hindus and Muslims attend uh, at at this uh, shrine, and uh, there's an annual uh, mela or, or great uh, festival in connection with uh, with Chishti, and he founded one of the major Sufi orders in northern India and in Pakistan. Uh, one of the things Sufis are attempting to accomplish is to achieve states of uh, union with God, with uh, states of ecstasy, alternative forms of consciousness that allow them uh, to see uh, more of uh, the true reality. Uh, this, the Sufi thinker Mohyeddin ibn Arabi uh, of the uh, 13th century, who was from southern Spain, from Andalusia, uh, said that places have a an influence on spiritual hearts. Uh, being in the presence of a saint allows uh, a finding. Um, uh, this is Professor Ernst's way of, of translating uh, wajd, which uh, the, the meaning of which is ecstasy, uh, but it, it, its etymology is in the word for to find. Um, and uh, this, this state of ecstasy uh, Ibn Arabi says, allows the joining uh, uh, of, of other virtues uh, in one's uh, spiritual consciousness, uh, a determination or himma, uh, and uh, allows the, saint, the influence of the saint's piety to linger. Um, this, is a, um, this is a picture of the shrine of Abdul Qadir al Jilani, the Qadri order. Uh, which began in Baghdad uh, in the medieval period is one of the most widespread and, uh, and, and most recognized uh, uh, orders of, uh, of Sufism. And um, again, modern, uh, modernists and, uh, and uh, more fundamentalist sorts of uh, Muslim often criticize Sufis for attending at shrines and tombs uh, but uh, most Muslims, uh, not the Wahhabis, but most Muslims uh, admit that there is a benefit to visiting the tomb of the Prophet in, in Medina. Um, Sufis were often itinerant, not always, but uh, many uh, traveled a great deal uh, to meet other spiritual exemplars. Uh, and uh, in the medieval period, the institution of the Khanaka or Sufi center, uh, which I mentioned uh, in the last lecture, uh, began. Uh, and um, uh, the travel was, was thought to be an opportunity to encounter great spiritual teachers, to kiss the feet of the saints, uh, and also to visit the tombs where blessings were thought to inhere. Uh, and uh, again, the tombs were, were thought to be places where one might have one's illness healed and uh, uh, might uh, might gain uh, a son or, or a child if, if, uh, if the life is barren. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, uh, leave this uh, lecture here, and uh, we'll come back for uh, part two next time. Thank you.